So we are all in unison in informing you that you need to seek information, expand knowledge and information. Did we ever say you yeah, just believe you're going to go to hell? Did you ever no, hear no, from no, anyone no. else? It's not our. Intelligent person like yourself need to come to this belief that this would show some illusion of design. Remember my word. You think it's design? No. You make a good point. Yeah. Okay, I would ask you a question in reverse. Um, do you believe that Mount Everest is a real thing? No, I would, I would focus on the bike first because defend your, defend your case if you really think because I think you paid unnecessary money for this bike when it popped into existence. So why do you think this definitely needs manufacturer when I'm telling you it just popped into existence and you've been you will not to pay all that money. You, you can have saved a lot of money. I mean, it doesn't mean you lie in bed. Yeah, I agree with you. If Allah wants you agree with me? Yeah, that, that this could. Yeah, that it could. He's capable of everything, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, in fact, but not only this bike, it could be anything. You know, yeah. uh, do you have a phone? Yeah. Even this phone could have popped into existence, right? Yeah. Just like that. Yeah. Yeah. But well, you paid money for it. Yeah, I, I paid money for it because I find it. Some people argue that it couldn't have because there's some kind of so complex of a design that is difficult to, you know, square up and saying that design demonstrates there's a designer. I mean, this is just a phone. I mean, when you look at the universe, the complexity of our universe. So this intricacy of the laws that are operating the, in the universe, do you think the universe is less complex than the bike or more complex? So something less complex, like a bike, you are arguing with me requires a designer. Are you saying the more complex requires no designer or it does require a designer? It's more complex. So we should always live between hope and fear. We shouldn't. I would say we don't know. About the bike, why don't you say we don't know? About why are you inconsistent? Because, because no, no, inconsistent. I already told you. Earlier. Have you seen that bike we being made in the manufacturer? This bike. So you haven't known this bike. No, this bike. So this universe and this bike. Have you seen this universe come into existence from nothing? I haven't. Have you? Right. Have I seen this bike coming into existence from nothing? I haven't. I haven't seen whether there's a manufacturer or a company that made it. Yeah, so exactly. bike and the universe, I think, is an equal footing in terms of comparisons. None of it we have seen. No, it's not. We haven't seen both. Have you seen the universe coming into existence? I've seen a bike being made. Hmm? I've seen a bike being made. But not this one. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, not this one. Right? I've seen other bikes being made. I know how a bicycle comes into place, the components for a bicycle, how the components are sold. The tires, what company makes them, okay. the manufacturing of what each exactly of those components, and how they come together. So I have something to work on because I've seen something already. So you're making this inference yeah. because you've seen the design features elsewhere, even though you haven't seen the maker. And as this bike shows the similar kind of design features, you're extrapolating your thinking and saying, "This, I also now." It's more likely, more likely to be designed to, design. to be made. So if I see the universe, everything around it, also showing design features, then if everything that I see looks like design and we see a designer, I see the broader picture of the universe, looks like it's designed. So it's more likely then extrapolating our thinking process and say the universe indeed has a maker. That is the most sensible extrapolation to do like you did with this one. The difference is, I haven't seen universes being made. Components, the laws, what do you mean the design. What do you mean by that? For example, do you know within our universe there operate certain physical laws and constants? That doesn't mean that Yeah, they're very, very precise. Yeah. It's to so many decimal places. So these kind of organization, which then makes things happen, for example, because of our electromagnetic forces, because of forces of attraction and, and so on, things happen. So that is a design feature in which this op makes things operate. If there were not these chemical properties within these chemicals, then things would not behave that way. The reason they behave that way is because of all those already inbuilt principles or governing laws that are there. That should demonstrate to us there is a designer or a governor or something that brought with intelligence this intelligent affair of things.
Oh, no. But if I ask you about a tree yeah. right there, and I tell you or ask you, was that tree planted or did it grow by itself? What would you say? This tree, I would, I would argue differently. Does this tree show any evidence of design feature? Now, suppose now I start making a tree from plastic, start building up and giving it leaves and barks, roots, and I'm trying to imitate that tree suppose a design feature and see whether this tree can somehow then grow right whether the water from the ground can go up the roots defying gravity to the top of that tree that I'm making yeah. and somehow it will then distribute the energy through the branches through the roots yeah. so if I gave you something similar to it you'd say wow that works but if I give you the real thing yeah. you would say it is not exhibiting design or would you say it does exhibit design I mean, you can if I give you a comparison if I give you a comparator I made a plastic tree plastic tree, plastic tree and trying to imitate the design features within it and somehow I can see through capillary suction of course the water has to go defying the up root and some kind of I'm giving all this chlorophylls within it to make photosynthesis with sunlight and so on and it's working you would say whatever I put in within this model tree there's a design feature in there that's why it's working like that because it has been organized and assembled with an intent of doing all of these things yeah. but I'm giving you the real thing which is the tree yeah. so when you look at it do you see any design feature I want yeah, you to be consistent. Yeah. You do. So when you see the design feature, yeah. then you are extrapolating that this design thing that is designed yeah. has been designed by no intelligence. No, is that what you're extrapolating? No, no, no. I'm, I'm extrapolating that the conditions for that tree are there in the same way it's there for the plastic tree. So are you, think, are you saying the plastic tree, if I were to leave it to the, the mercy of nature, Mother Nature, and then the wind and the temperature and the salinity and the humidity and the sunlight, and they can somehow make this thing assemble and work? No, if it was plastic, or if it was like a natural... No, plastic, tree, plastic. Why don't you want to address a natural tree? No, 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 I'm just taking out. Why am I not able to envisage or even imagine that natural forces that are operating within nature can assemble this similar to a tree and make it within this design feature like and make it operable that it operates it for a synthesis happens why why can i not say that's possible i would say it wouldn't be possible because um it's it's an artificial um, thing like tree plastic tree and this would require you to artificially regulate the conditions no no if i give plastic tree Firstly, why do I need to have this kind of required assembly for it to work? Everybody because, it's... because that's the way it works with this particular design assembly. Without that design assembly, there will be no photosynthesis of my model tree. Yeah. There will not be capillary suction. Yeah. So it has to have this design feature built in. Yeah. Does that require any intelligence? Yeah. Are you certain? Yeah. So if I see a tree with the similar kind of design feature, does it require intelligence for that design feature to be assembled in that way? Not necessarily. So now you're saying not necessarily. So why does my plastic tree require an intelligence? Why didn't you say not necessarily? I mean, I could, you haven't answered my question, which is looking at that tree. No, no, we can go to your question. Remember, I'm not going to avoid your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am saying, why are you having two sets of standards? Yeah. One you for the for, for for a tree, you don't require necessarily an intelligence. Yeah. yeah. But for a model of that tree, somehow mimicking that design feature, you require intelligence. Yeah. I would like to know what makes you that kind of inconsistent decisions between the two. Because intelligence is um, what's the word? Active for something to be as a result of intelligence. It's been actively um, designed in a kind of way. Was that yeah. passively designed? 
I don't know. It could, it could so, have been so let's understand what I mean by. So let's understand something. Can randomly a plastic model of a tree no, appear? A real tree. No, 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 no. Let's talk about design feature. Why can we not get randomly? Randomly, right? On my lab, yes. a tree growing without from seeds, just the material components that is there within nature, it just assembles by itself. By passive assembly, by randomness. I can't, I can't speak for that regarding plastic. But why, why do you assume that for assembly, in a particular way, you require intelligence? Well, it's, we're talking about like an artificial thing, right? No, it's not about artificial or natural or synthetic. It I mean, is, synthetic. It is. The, the issue is about because assembly, assembling something that requires a particular way of assembling it to make sure it functions in a particular way. For example, your heart, how much time and effort and scientific thought has gone in to make artificial heart? Do you know? Yeah, a lot. But we can't still make a heart as functional as this. We can make artificial blood, we can make all But to make something as organic and natural like this, as like, like the eye and so on, why do we then say, you know what, let's get a transplant? Because the transplant is the real thing. We can't get this real thing, the design feature, made artificially, even though the best scientists around the world can come, come together, they can't put together like a human fly. Oh, sorry, not a human fly, the real fly. No scientist on Earth can come together and say, you know what, let's assemble a fly and then it just goes there. All you can do is make a robotic fly that has certain design imitations from the natural flies. So why is it impossible for us to do something which is nature, which has no intelligence, has done it? Why is this inconsistent in this atheistic worldview? It is not the blind watchmaker argument. Don't fall for that trap. So why do we have these double standards? We are talking about design, and we are talking about what is required for such kind of design. Do we need intelligence, or do we need just randomness? That's the question. If, if, if you would answer my question... Which is now, okay, let's deal with your question. Yeah, so basically, question. you would not answer mine because... No, I wouldn't come back to you. Uh, come back to me. You. Okay, come back first. to my question. Okay, your question is... Look at that tree. Yep, I'm looking at the tree. Can you say for a fact that a person planted that tree? Or it grew by itself, randomly? No, what I can say is, I do not know personally someone planted the seed for that tree or not, or, or that seed itself, the seed came because someone dropped it. But the fact that I know for sure, yes. that tree didn't pop into existence, number one. And I'll tell you my reasons why. That bike may have, and you say it's possible as well, that that tree could not have popped into existence from nothingness, and that tree must have come from a source, like a seed. Or it could have been artificially, what's called, you know, in, when we do, I don't know the particular term for it, like from a branch that we can actually grow. A, yeah, 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 yeah. Like yeah, we're yeah, talking about yeah. this kind of uh, cross, grafting, grafting whatever, yeah. right? Yeah. Without those component sources, this tree would not be there at all. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course. So, 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 whether this was planted by a man or not, they did not intelligently design the genetic component within the seed. That the seed needs to split. Without the right condition to split, the seed would never split. That seed then splits, and then it starts growing leaves and roots. Why so? Because there is a genetic code embedded within the seed, the information. That code is an assembly of information yeah. which you and I didn't assemble. This assembly is the question I'm asking you. Without intelligence assembling this information, can we believe that tree can just come? Can we believe this bike can pop into existence? Can we believe human being can pop into existence? Can we believe our universe can pop into existence and stuff like that? Without the information. Without intelligent agency assembling that information and dispersing as it is in our cosmos today. Without the information, no. Without the um, intelligence. So what assembled, what intelligent agency assembled this information? I don't know. It has to be something, right? It's not nothingness. Why, 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 why does it have to be something? 
Is it nothing then? No, I'm asking you. Right. There is two binary options. It's either something or it's nothing. You don't have a third thing in between. It's something or nothing. Nothing is the absence of something, and something is something. As to what this something is, we can talk about it, but it cannot be anything else in between. There is no third option. It's either made by something, designed by something, information assembled by something, or it's by nothingness. Or some things. Something or things is the same thing. It's something. Whether it's a singular or in plural, okay. it's the same thing. Okay. Could it be nothingness? Maybe, um... Could nothingness have assembled this information within the cosmos? What do you mean by nothingness? Okay, very, very good, very simple question. What I'm trying to illustrate with you by nothingness is the absence of something. So this nothingness is a concept which I am now telling you that it is the absence of time, space, energy, quantum fields, everything that you can imagine. It's basically the absence of anything. That's no thing. No thing means there is no energy, there is no space, there is no matter, there is no quantum fluctuations, there is no quant quarks and particles, nothing. It's the absence of all of that. So would you consider um, dark matter to be nothing? It's not nothing, it's something. Dark matter is not <laughs> nothing, it's something. Even though it's in its... Uh... What is it? What is the dark matter according to scientists? Yeah, go ahead. Because I'm just working based off your definition. Yeah. The definition I provided is not a definition that you know you would find difficult to understand. It's the philosophical concept of nothing, where it's this absence of everything. Not Lawrence Krauss's definition of something, which is quantum fields, which is something. Fields are something. Okay, so. Dark matter is composed of particles. Particles, below. stop there, that's it. It's, it's a matter. Particles is something. So dark matter is something. Whether it's a particle, and if the particle is energy or quantum fluctuation, it's something. So nothingness is the absence of all of that. Well, then I would say it didn't come from nothing. Very good. I agree with you. Because nothingness, while it's nothing, it cannot make something. Yeah. So our cosmos must have been originated by something. Yes, yeah, something. Yeah. That something must exist. Yeah. Must have ability and power to bring about something. Okay. Without the power and ability, how is it going to do it? Ability, okay. okay. Yeah. That something must have a choice or intent. Because no. otherwise, okay, why do you say no? Because uh, choice or intent would require something conscious, right? No, no, we can find out whether it's conscious or not. But I'm saying it's like this. If I leave your bike like this here, yeah. and you're standing by, yeah. do you think this bike will start riding itself and say, you know what, jump on, and it, you know, it forces you to jump on, and then start riding you to your destination? Would it ever do that? Nope. Because this doesn't have an intent. It doesn't have this intention yeah, or a choice. Conscious. It's not conscious. No. Whether intention comes from consciousness or conscious agents, we can we can we can we can talk about it. But this needs to intend that action to take place. Yeah. So this universe, if there was something there, and all the components was there for it to then make our universe as it is, but there was no intent behind this change, would that change ever happen? Just like your bike will stand there, it will never happen, it will never move, it will be because it doesn't have the intention to do. I try to give an example of a kitchen with, with making a cup of tea or coffee. You have you, you've been to a kitchen and made yeah, coffee? Yeah. Everything is there in place. The teapot, the milk in the fridge, the fridge, the water, the sink, and everything is there. If you just sit there without any agency with intent. With, without any agency within, remember, agency is something, yeah. not nothingness. With intent, would a cup of tea or a coffee ever be made? Give billions of zillions of years. It doesn't have to. Would you ever make? Would you ever assemble? Uh, no, but it doesn't have to be only with intent. No, 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 no. Why would it assemble if there was no intention to assemble in that particular way? Like, you know what? A cup comes along, yeah. and then it goes into the sink, yeah. the tap opens, the water flows. The tap stops, the it comes up. 
maybe and, and, and yeah yeah the milk the fridge door opens the milk comes out the lid opens and it starts pouring on it the tea tea is there in the cupboard up there the cupboard doors open and inside that there the tea bag one bag comes in the sugar comes along opens whatever the, your container of sugar is you need a spoon whatever and the sugar comes along and start mixing it look all of this assembly requires intent whether it's done by your robot or by yourself without any intent to make a cup of tea or coffee by something which possesses this intention it will not intention it could be a pro program robot which okay. is the intent behind it it will never happen okay but that's because it's making coffee or tea the universe wasn't what always if, like that what if what if what if we use like an example of fire fire um starting in a bush does that require does that necessarily have to require intent no, no, no. you have to have to have the fire stuff it has to be the reason stuff. yeah it's not gonna happen from nothing is it no 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 not intent yeah. intent does it have to be intentionally started it doesn't have to be intentionally, but it could be natural causes, but something's kind of... The fire... Something, I don't think it could be something, something started. The something fire... Could be birds, it could be... Right, striking, right, right. Dry, dry, so, dry. so you're saying, yeah. fine. So what you're saying is, there's a possibility of accidental intent yeah. causing the fire. Accidental intent? Yeah, because no one intended to do yeah. the fire. Natural, a bush fire, it's, it's just, it just okay, happened happen. because of... It can't be, it can't okay. be an give me, accident. Give me, an example of, give me an example of a fire that is caused. Uh, how does it start? How does the fire start? The fire starts when... Uh, the one that doesn't require an intelligence agency or intent. Give me an example of that so we can understand it better. Okay, so let's say there are um, dry grasses. Let's say this land is full of dry grasses. Dry grasses? Yes. Yeah. been dried sunny. out. Very yeah. sunny. Yeah, very sunny. Like uh, there's little water in this yeah. environment. Right. So they dry out, they die yeah. out. Sure. And then um, let's say... Um, there are lightning strikes lightning strikes area Fine. and one of the strikes happens to you know when thunderstorms happen and then lightning hits the floor and some people can um, go in electro electrocuted Cute it? yeah from the lightning storm so something like that could start a fire sure yeah, where it yeah, just strikes the, something just pulls it the grass yeah it's something not like did. It did. it's not like it didn't happen randomly it did happen randomly. no not really because if there was no sun what happened if it was raining would it would it happen would the fire start then what is intent? Yeah, but some let's, let's address this issue now. Because so I'm, I'm not saying it is. I'm not saying something didn't start it. Yeah. I'm saying it's not intentionally. It's intentionally, but something did cause it. Yeah, of course. For example, like this, so, it's, it's dry grass, yeah. the sun, yeah, the heat, yeah. and it happens. Yeah. Well, we know that happens. Yeah. But something did cause it in between. It's not like it randomly happened. The sun, just, if, if, it was, instead of, if it wasn't sun and it was raining or cloudy, it wouldn't happen. No, the fire wouldn't start. Yeah. You know what I mean? So there is a reason behind some, anything, anything behind it. Even for your existence, there's a reason behind why you breathe it. Okay. And if there was no air. Can we come back to the fire example? Yeah, yeah. Fine. So this fire, so there's a law operating for combustion here. Yeah. So there's a law in place that if you have this kind of strikes there and this happens, you have this ignition happening and then things burn because of what happens, the properties of what we mean by combustion. You have oxygen, without any oxygen, oxygen, this will not burn. So the chemical reaction that are going to take place to ignite and combust and to produce this fire, yeah. it's already there. So let's go back to our scenario. There is something that is there yeah. always and it is there with all these right elements, right laws already to ignite, to combust, to start a reaction. Yeah. yeah. Think about now one step backward. So you are now giving something that is there requires to be in existence for our universe is there already with inherent properties yeah. already exist with inherent properties in yeah. which it would then operate in such a way yeah. so the conditions and laws and everything is there inherently there yeah can you explain that how do we get something to exist with this inherent property How do we get something to exist with this inherent property? Yeah.
I was to like making coffee. In both examples, they've got the properties. Your coffee, you've got your coffee, that's something. You've got the hot water, you've got all of those things. But one of them necessarily requires you to intentionally make coffee. Do you think accident can make coffee? Let's, 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 no, let's, no. Let's, let's give the same kind of things that we give to wild fire yeah. on, 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 that happens on the you know, dry grasses, something yeah. like that. Because do you think if we were to do something like that in a, and then it would make coffee? No, I don't think so. Why? Because the coffee assembly is much more complicated, much more designed. Compared to your ignition in the fire, the universe, yeah, okay. the way the universe has assembled itself with, it, with this assembly is very organized complexity. The coffee example is very less organized complexity. So this coffee or tea with the example of a fire that starts by itself from nature with all this heat of sunlight or elect electricity, it's not going to make your coffee or tea. Yeah, but it also, but also doesn't require you to start it. No, what I'm saying is the whole idea is to understand the intention behind complex assembly of information. Our universe demonstrates complexity of organized information, which is harmonious. They work together. That's why we're trying to achieve what we call the one uni unifying principle of force. force. Make everything, not electricity and magnetism one, but electromagnetism is one, electromagnetism. And likewise, every other force, there could be just one force altogether. So this organized assembly of information, as complex as the universe, and if you compare that with a fire that starts on a, a, you know, an, a, what is it called, in a forest, or a tea or a coffee that makes be made in a... There's no comparison. Because one, the complexity of information that is assembled is beyond comparison. So I am highlighting a fact, what we call the level of complexity of information and the assembly that has happened. The information like in our DNA, the amount of assembly that is there, it's mind-boggling if you study genetics. But people just somehow just say, oh, it just happened by evolutionary processes over time because there are biological systems, and biological systems, you know what, they just add into complexity because complex information by, can be added to an existing system by mutations that develop into more and more complex, more and more developed organisms because these are living beings. But the point remains again because we are talking about assembly of complex information without intelligence without intelligence without intelligent agency you in your everyday life you would not accept anything but when it comes to the nature all around you when it comes to the universe the physical laws you are told to accept it because the scientists are trying to condition us to think that way why because the alternative option is what to believe in a originator Think about it. Science has become dogmatic. They do not want us to become someone called like creationists, to believe in a creation. This is a creation. Because that means knowing the reason why you're created, perhaps subscribe to an organized religion, the do's and don'ts. Scientists are conditioned and conditioning us to make us think that we are liberal human beings, we should just live our life and that's it. That is it. Even though we know for ourselves 
that there's this dichotomy between, you know, thinking about the natural universe and anything, everything else we do. Look at the mic that I'm holding. There's no way in a billion and zillions of years your mind will say it just assembled itself. Even a mic like that, okay? It's a, it's a wireless mic. But still, because of the complexity of the information, the information that is coded in our DNA is way, way more complex. And yet we are told to accept it because of that process called evolution, it can happen. That is the difference. So our outlook should be not of one of just simply saying, you know what, science has somehow explained the origin of life, the origin of how the process of you know, a biogenesis or biogenesis, and go back and say, or oh, even the origin of matter, because we are extrapolating even further back. What about the origin of everything? Why does something exist other than nothing? Science is not in a stage to answer those questions yet. Yeah, and that doesn't mean that because we don't have an answer for it, a lack of evidence is not the Intelligence is still required. Everyday experience tells you you require intelligence. But when it comes to creator, originator of our universe, we are told not to go to that path. That is why if we look at the Quran, we are Muslims, if you look at the Quran, our creator addresses us and says, look, look into the creation, look, travel around the earth, travel inside the earth and see how our creator originated this creation. In fact, you'll be surprised, you'll be surprised how the Quran addresses not just Muslims and other people of other faiths, but it also addresses people of no faith. It says, all people who have no faith, like all, all people who disbelieve. It goes like this. I'll translate in a second, right? أَوَلَمْ يَرَى الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا أَنَّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ أَنَّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ كَانَتَا رَتْقًا كَانَتَا رَتْقًا فَفَتَقْنَاهُمَا وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حَيٍّ أَفَلَا يُؤْمِنُونَ Just to translate the meaning of this, have the unbelievers, those who have no faith, have they not known that the heavens and the earth, anything beyond the earth, the sky, the cosmos is the heavens, not as in paradise, the heavens. Have the unbelievers not known that the heavens and the earth was joined together as one piece and God parted it asunder and he bought every living thing from water. Would they then not believe? I want to just quickly mention this, how the statement is addressed to a non-believer it ends with something interesting. Would they then not believe? So it's asked, first of all, have you not seen it already? Have you not known it already? Do you not see? Do you not observe? Do you not know? And then it gives something in between. And then it says, of course, rhetorically, or even actually, would you then not believe? So we expect if something is addressed directly by the author of the Quran, which claims to be God, and then it, at the end it says, would you then not believe there's something information for us to reflect on as a matter of evidence and proof for its claim it's making. So what does the Quran say? It gives you two pieces of information. One from astrophysics and one from biology within the same breath. Every living thing is from water. And that's why we, we our understanding of biology is that if you want life, you need to have sources of water. That's why when you go to go elsewhere in other planets, on, in, whether it's go to Mars or something, what are there any signs of water for the life that we know of, carbon-based life? Yes, so we, wrote, we do know now today, for life to exist and subsist and to persist, we need light, water. What was the first information? That heavens and the earth was joined together as one piece. Was that the case? Now we know from our scientific investigations and inquiry, the conclusion is yes, our universe at one point was, the earth and everything was joined together in, in a, it doesn't have to be Big Bang, whatever, it was in a singularity, it was united, yes. and that got, got separated. Yes. And the separation the Quran describes, this is how the Bedouin Arabs were explaining with each other. The word rataq and fataq, it's like, it's like a forceful, um, um, uh, uh, what's this world? forceful way of separation. So the Big Bang is described as something that is separated with this force. And it's expanding. Yeah. The Quran does mention expanding, but that's not the point I'm making here. I'm making the point the Quran addresses in this verse, that was the common origin. So the Quran is telling us, telling the people who don't believe, that this is something that you know. Have you not known it? Yeah, now you know, and the Quran is then asking you, why would you then not believe them? Because the splitting of that, 
the bringing of life from water again is something that you know that this some we have come to know now today is what is required did the author of this book if it happened to be prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam did he go underneath the dead volcano and find out the living organisms there and whether they're consistent of water did he go in the depths of the most you know depth ocean and find out the living organism there still water-based he hadn't he was living in a desert did he have telescopes did he know about redshift did he know about all the stars are receding from each other of course he didn't so how would you expect that someone from a desert who was known to be unlettered to give you that information that's one thing to reflect on on top of that, as you read the Quran, you'll realize one by one, it gives you, you know, cumulative information for you to reflect and say, why is it that this Quran is giving you all that information from our natural world, which I know that is true now, with our scientific advancements of knowledge. We have learned, we have accumulated the knowledge of the Greeks and the Hindus and all the other civilizations and the Islamic civilization. Now we know this is the case. And the Quran is telling us all of that. I am not saying this is a miracle. I am only merely pointing to you the fact that the Quran is offering you the information to reflect on given 1440 years ago or more. From a man who they people knew didn't know about science, technology, anything like that. Okay? And yet even the science and technology of that day wasn't as developed to give us that information. Yeah. And if we understand about the principles of intelligent is assembly, then why are we simply saying no, it is possible by randomness and random chance? Because in fact, randomness is our ignorance about all the factors that are in place. There's no such thing as random. Nothing is random. Nothing. Nothing is random. Suppose, Nothing, Nothing is suppose, random. Why if you win a lottery? Yes. Why if you are you, are you saying you, you're going to know for a fact? When you, win, you win a lottery, lottery yeah. when you win a lottery, do you think it's a random? What happens when you win a lottery? You just buy a ticket, yeah. which happens to be happening, matching with that. Okay? Yeah. It didn't happen by random. It's one of those combinations that yeah. just happened to be there. Well, you didn't know about it. You don't, you don't know. Yeah, yeah it's but you, win you. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it doesn't mean it's random. It is already decided. That number is already... Win. Brother, Sorry. this number is already decided. Yeah. That this is the winning number. Yeah, of course. It's just that you didn't have that number. The number was there, you just picked up this. So you randomly picked the winning No, no, you didn't randomly pick. So you intentionally picked. No, 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 no. You didn't intentionally pick that number. You picked a number which was already designed to be like that. Yeah. But this assembly, this number that is going to be the winning number, it's already decided. Yeah. It wasn't simply something decided like, oh, you know what, the winning number would be something else. They have decided what the winning number is going to be by what? When they roll, whatever the process to do that. Yeah. Okay. Now, you might think, okay, not the person who picked it up, but the actual machine that generated the number happened by randomness, right? But is that the case? If you have, imagine balls in a particular basket or something, that's what they use. And they blow air and then one by one the ball comes with a number on it. And that's the number. But guess what? This is why this is not random. If we knew the speed of the air that is pumped in that particular drum, if you need the weight, the surface area of the ball, the height, the width, the density, all of that, if we knew all of that, you can with your physics and mathematics can determine exactly that this is the number the ball that's going to pick up. It's just we don't know all of those factors because the interaction between all the other balls. Remember, when something like if, if I have a few marbles and I dropped it, it's not happening by random. All of it is determined by how this particular ball is going to hit the other ball, the nature it's going to hit in terms of the force, how the forces of repulsion or attraction is going to be there. How, you know, snooker. Think about snooker and this ball for now. When people hit a ball, and then after one, two, three, four, five, six, all these things, and it goes into the pocket. It's not random, because they knew exactly how much strength and force, and the angle they need to put, and the elevation, all of that is calculated. Because that player have worked it out, he can put, it, put the ball into the hole. These balls that are designed, if we knew all of those factors, just like the player, we could say it's going to be 29. It's going to be five. 
We don't, don't know that yet. So that's why there's no such thing as randomness. Nothing is random. Everything, if you, if you, it's a mind-boggling concept. So what, but would you, what would you name the state of not knowing? What would lead to the... No, no, we don't know all of the factors. Yeah. That's, that's, that, that's our ignorance about the factors. But the, the, the factors are all there for us to know and learn. That's why the more science we do, the more factors we eliminate. You see, when we do science, we want to establish the root cause of why this happened, or even forensic science. So we look at a knife that is there with the blood on, yeah. and a fingerprint. Yeah. And we can see the video footage of this man who actually did this job. We are eliminating all these factors which are not responsible. And then we say, okay, uh, there you go. This is why we're saying this person is responsible, because all of the factors point towards that this is the criminal that did this act. If we didn't know all of that, you might just even say like, just like the bike popped into existence, you might say, the knife popped into existence from nothing, and then it just stopped this guy, and the guy bled to death. It's imaginable, it's possible according to this theory of probability, it just happened. But the judge and the jury would not buy that. Why? Because of the complexities involved of in terms of these kind of things that are happened. Otherwise, it could simply say, you know what, if the factors determine that, you know what, this man actually slipped and there was this knife there, like this, you know, and then he got stopped. Understandable. But the way things are described, he was running and a knife was running behind him on someone's hand. That's not chance. You can eliminate all of that. So we look at this universe, we can observe this universe and we can make these inferences. All of these complexities which are organized, assembly, this we can say safely, confidently, reasonably, rationally, that this is all from a maker, from a designer, from an originator. This originator has put this all here in place. It's only this dogmatic, uh, scientists who don't want us to believe in it, they're telling us otherwise. You, you um, started off by saying science is um, dogmatic, they are feeding us false information, and then you started to qualify um, the Quran's uh, description, the, the, what you said earlier. I'm giving you information. About, yeah, about you can make split. whatever you make. No, no, you can make your inference based on the data provided. Remember, the universe shows us data, yeah. data of assembly. Yeah. You make the conclusion based on what you see about the data. Yeah. Quran provides you data. Yeah. You make the conclusion, is this data driven by intelligence or randomness, or it just happened by someone who just happened to know? Yeah. That is what we are bringing you. Yeah, I mean, the question I was trying to ask is, is science right or is it wrong? No, no. Science is say, just a mechanism yeah. in which to understand this assembly, this process to make conclusions which are intelligent conclusions. We won't make a conclusion by looking at all this data and assembly points, design feature of this bike, even though I haven't seen the manufacturer, yeah. but according to the scientific way of thinking, yeah. we would say this is designed by intelligent designer. Yeah. We'll make that conclusion, even though none of us, none of the scientists who are concluding this would have seen it. Yeah. So we observe the data, look at the complexity of the data and the assembly of the data, and we make intelligent conclusions, reasonable conclusions, inferences which should make sense. So this universe is like your big bike, all out there, assembled. You can either, if you want to believe on this happened by nothingness, which you said no, by something that is always there with inherently possessing the attributes of change, making change, the ability to make change, design and so on, it's up to you. But to me, it all makes sense to me, this is me personally, and I'm sure many Muslims will agree with me, that this exhibits that there is behind all of this, not only intelligent, someone intelligent, someone who possesses a will, intentions, awareness, consciousness, power, knowledge as well. Because it requires knowledge to assemble these things. So when I say intelligence, I didn't just put the factor out that this is a lot of knowledge, possessor of knowledge. Knowledge, anyone or anything that possesses knowledge and does things, cannot do these things with this kind of assembly of knowledge unless it's self-aware. So this is where we are making it one step forward with our argument. This is a conscious, self-aware agency able to create our universe and able to maintain our universe in this way and still, you know, what we call sustain our universe.
We cannot do that. There is nothing that you can imagine that can see in our universe which can do that, that can bring about our universe and maintain it like that. A being or an agency must be such a powerful being, such a powerful agent, such a knowledgeable agent, such an agent of might that is only can be described to be a creator, God in our sense, who deserves our attention, deserves our praise and our thanks and our glory. And that's what we mean by being someone who is God, who is worthy of all of that. Do you agree with that? Do you agree with as a creator? Um, I agree with the fact that um, all of these things did not um, necessarily happen. I can't remember. No, no, I'm trying to avoid those words. Um, I think where we disagree it isn't with the fact that something happened. The Big Bang, obviously, I, I uh, recognize that. But the intention part, that's the shaky disagreement. That's, that's the point of contention. Like intention, conscious, agent, um, those type of like qualifiers for it. You find that shaky? Yeah, that's, that's the point where we disagree. Because, um, it's not it's not being very like clear cut to explore what intention is consciousness what does so we, we, we get to a point where is. actually if it's clarified that you need intention behind all of these things then there's another one step further you can go with your line of thinking isn't it yeah. because that is stopping you from accepting this as an agency which is personal which is something that is alive or which is living yeah. so i would say think about the complexity of information information in our dna yeah. information about our universe the physical laws and so on and that level of complexity since at what point we would subscribe to a view that this is too much to um, assign you know non-conscious agency or this is a point we have to assign a conscious agency let me give you a simple example one of the simplest example is you find a piece of paper and it's got written on it looks like english writing yeah. we're speaking english I'm, I'm i'm certain you you know how to read english yeah. hey, what's your name michael he says dear michael it was a pleasure meeting in speaker's corner on the 30th uh, is it 30th? Mm -hmm. On the 29th of May 2022, uh, we had a discussion about 5.30, and there were a lot of people there, a lot of cameras uh, working, and we talked about intelligence, we talked about agency, we talked about DNA, we talked about the example of a tree and so on and so forth, and you were wearing this beautiful T-shirt which had New York and so on, and you had a bike that we discussed about the aerodynamic feature because it's thin that makes it faster. Yeah. Um, so, um, by the way, um, this is Mansoor speaking to you. I'm writing to you. I forgot to, um, you know, send my email, my phone number. Here is my phone number, and you can actually call this number. And I'm free, available, you know, after the evening, um, and I'll see you next week. And it's got my name on it. Oh, not my name. It says Mansoor on it. Yeah. If you see that piece of information. At what point would you say this, I have to say, it is not from a non-conscious agency, but must be from a conscious agency. That piece of information, which may be about 10 lines on a piece of paper in English language. Not giving you the theory of relativity, how to derive it, how to prove it. No mathematical formulas. It's simply an English, you know, someone, they met you at Speaker's Corner on this day at this time and the discussion they had. That's all. There is nothing, you know, you know, uh, a discovery that is there about like, this is how you're going to win a Nobel Prize or the next lottery. None of that. Simply that experience. At what point you'd say, you know what? I am not going to think that this is from a non-conscious agency. But in fact, it is most likely to me, it's from a conscious agency. Agency which is conscious with knowledge and intent to write and so on and so forth. So explore that. Can you explain a bit more? How would you come to that conclusion? I mean, I would, we make assumptions all the time. So yeah. I would assume that based upon the interaction I have with you, that it's out to be very specific from coming from you because I spoke to you one on one and it couldn't be but is it possible it can come from a non-conscious agency yeah I mean it could come from anyone it could come no, from non-conscious agency meaning 
like a robot. No, no, no. Okay, non-conscious, non-intelligent agency that is not programmed to write something like that, like your bike, for a example. Dumbass. Your bike, for example. Can your bike write that letter? No. No, of course. So think about anything like this bike, which is non-conscious, non-intelligent agency. Can it write a letter like that? No. So you would be quite certain and happy and comfortable and be confident and content that this definitely is from a conscious agency. Yeah, conscious, yeah. So the information that is in the letter is not the most complex thing that we see in the universe or the universe itself. Yeah. The universe demonstrates way, way more complex organized information. Yeah. If that piece of information, you are so content that it requires a conscious intelligent agency I must be asking simply to go and reflect on it, not necessarily now, and widen this reflection about the whole cosmos, which is more and more greater in complexity and in more intelligence and assembly and information, because there are complexity of information and has levels. A, B, C, A, B, or whatever, random letters is one type of information. That's just random letters. If I say A, C, A, T, O, it's like a cat. Yep. And ne ne next, one second, brother. Next level of complexity. It's like giving you some information, and then a cat is trying to eat fish. So the level of information goes more and more as it becomes more and more meaningful in our language. Expresses some meaning, some statements which are true, some statements which make sense. That letter, amount of information is in there, is actually astronomically quite high in terms of what it can come by randomness. But besides that, I am saying, think about the whole cosmos, not the DNA, the whole cosmos, the physical laws, the information that are assembled, like it, within it. Is it possible that we can even imagine with our contentment in our heart? At the end of the day, that's what matters. Can our heart be content and say, that level of complexity, Possible yeah. by chance. The, the, the word is like from, created by men, by uh, humans, sorry. So when I see like a letter, I will say the human wrote it. Bike, uh, when, when you see a bike, you know that a bike like a human uh, built that, you will say Someone it's a human. Intelligent. Yeah, but when you see a, like a universe, you, you don't know who who made that. So, so you, can, you can jump, you can jump to conclusion. Know, you can jump to conclusion. I want to show you something very quickly, okay, brother. This is a translation of the meaning of the Quran. Quran is an Arabic language, this is in English. One of the chapters, chapter 112 of the Quran, right? The 114 chapters. It's telling us about that intelligent agency. We believe the intelligent agency, which we call the creator, originator, has sent us this information through this agency, human agency called the Prophet, or a warner, or a messenger, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he has told him this, say, he is Allah, one, only, unique, the eternal refuge, the independent, the absolute, the one who doesn't produce anything, children, families, offspring, and the one who is not born, doesn't beget, is not born, is not something generated or produced. There is nothing like unto him in whatsoever way. No comparison, no co-equal, nothing. No likeness of his likeness. There's nothing comparable unto him. So the agency that we're talking about is an agency that is one and absolute. And if you think about it, which we haven't talked about, is for our universe, you can only have one such agency. Otherwise, the universe will come to a corruption and ruin because there will be there will be conflict of will and intent. If there is an intent, there will be conflict of all of these things because we are talking about one, one absolute entity who is not generated, as you said, it's not something that was nothing and then came into existence. Always there, Always eternal. There. Being eternal means possessing the attributes inherently because you are always there. So that's where the answer is. The agency which has demonstrating all of this complexity and assembly and intelligence and will and, and intent and the decision to make changes, these were inherently within this and that demonstrate that agency is also someone who is ever living. So not born, not giving birth because there will be another one or not producing or duplicating itself and there's nothing like unto it. So this is how the Quran tells us what this is. Remember, we wanted to know, okay, if there's such a thing, what is the nature of that thing? The Quran throughout it 
throughout this book tells about the nature of this agency. So, so what do you agree with what you agree with what is No, I don't agree. Uh, that's my next point. So you made a claim that for this um, creator, there has to be for the universe which was created by this creator, all of the properties are already part of the creator. No, the creator must inherently possess all of the, the, no, the characteristics that is already demonstrative of our universe being here. For example, the creator must possess energy. Okay. The creator must possess knowledge. Okay. Because things which demonstrate knowledge in action, yeah. you have to have a knowledgeable agency yeah already there to see, for example, a manufacturer which will know, which is knowledgeable, mm. human beings or robots that are programmed by human beings, yeah. needs to be there for this bike to be here. Okay. So the creator must be possessor of intelligence and knowledge, must be possessor of power or energy, ability, and I also says intent, because without the intent, the level of complexity will not be demonstrable. So does the creator um, possess flesh? No, the creator is, he, he says already, there's nothing like unto this creator. Whatever you imagine, flesh, wood, plastic, human beings, trees, sun, moon, nothing. All of this is nothing comparable to the creator. So our creator of our universe, this existence, yeah. is unlike anything of what this cosmos. Right. So, so the creator... comes from the creator. The creator who has characteristics but it's not like this creation. The creator is different from the creation. How, 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 the manufacturer how, how, how of this, to give you an example, brother, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah please, thank you. This bike, we don't expect this bike to be a maker who is also look like a bike. Do you follow? We don't need to yeah, don't. somehow automatically assume yeah. the one who made this bike must be like a bike. Yeah. Possessor, possessing of metal and plastic and rubber and then all this grease and so on and so forth. We don't, we don't need to extrapolate yeah. that way. So our maker of our universe, the creator of our universe, doesn't have to be like this. In fact, the creator tells us it's not like it. And there is a reason for this. This creation with all these properties that are within it is limited, finite and dependent. These are interweaved properties and characteristics of our universe. The creator is not bound by this limitation and weakness and deficiencies. I call that deficiencies. The creator is unlike that, so that's why we say he's absolute. Absolute in all the characteristics. If the creator has knowledge, his knowledge is all, all knowledgeable. He knows everything, nothing is hidden. Not a leaf falls, he's aware of it. Not the darkest night and the darkest ant hiding under the darkest rock. The creator is aware of its movements. That is the level of the subtle knowledge that the creator has, as described by our Quran. And it makes sense because the one who, Quran says, Would he then not know who created you? He's the most sublime, the subtle, the all aware. Because the one who made this bike knows about this bike, about plastics and rubber. The one who knows about this universe, he knows all of that. Why would it not be all aware? So our creator has knowledge about all things and everything. That's what the Quran says. So the Quran is something that, you know, I hope at least this is an introduction to you about the Islamic faith in which our faith is not based on blind faith, but on reasoned analysis and conviction. That Quran says, annahu la ilaha illallah. No with certainty that there is no deity or God worthy of worship except our Creator, except Allah. We have to have knowledge. So we can't just simply believe we have to go through this process of elimination and rejection. There is no God worthy of worship. This is not God. You are not God. The tree is not God. This land is not God. Nothing is God. The sun, the moon, planets, the black holes. Nothing is God. Nothing is our Creator. Nothing is the originator of this universe except the one who made it, Allah. That is the negation and affirmation in Islam. When someone becomes a Muslim, this is the process we go through. That we say, La ilaha, no God or no deity worthy of worship, illallah, except Allah. So it's a rational conviction. Brother, when uh, Brother Mansur suggested that, you know, 
in the Quran everything is written so why sh anybody should read it because we all have got intellect we can you know realize things we can understand we can reason out things and all that it's on the same principle we got all have got eyes and in our eyes we got light and we can always see so it's just why do we need an added light but the thing is that suddenly if there is darkness or at night there is no light though you have got light in your eyes you need an added light to be able to see Similarly, the Quran is, uh, you know, we have got an intellect, but we need an added, added guidance to be able to comprehend everything which is said. So that was my point. Thank you. So the Quran is like a manual of our life. It gives us guidance to know, first of all, who we are, where we come from and where we're going, and what's going to happen to us when we go. So, you see, often and not, you will see the liberal capitalistic society that we're living in today doesn't want us to think about these existential questions. It is trying to say, you know, you can study philosophy if you're interested, but leave that question. Enjoy. You know, eat this, dine here, wear this, go there, watch that. This all telling you, Time Out magazine, for example, or something like that, isn't it? It tells you, this is where you should go to enjoy yourself. This is what you should be eating. This is what you should be wearing. All of that. They're telling you to consume. This is the called the religion of materialism. They want to preoccupy us with the materialistic life in which you are living your life of hedonism where you, you know that you're going to die, but they don't want you to think that that's it. They want you to enjoy every moment of your life as it lasts and don't worry about death. But they don't want us to tell this one thing. Why are you here in the first place? All of that, this beautiful assembly that you are human being, that you are, everything is assembled in particular order. Your heart is assembled in such a way, differently than from your liver, differently than your kidneys. Because the cells, during the initial development of the embryo, the cells started migrating in groups, and they assembled to group to make this tissue. This programming is there. You didn't design it. Your parents didn't design it. There was no blueprint for your parents. Your mom and dad said, you know what? These cells, we want them to go and recognize each other and settle there and make that tissue called the heart, the organ. None of that. This intelligent designed exhibition in your body, you must think if all parts of our body has a set function. Now I want to really think about it. I don't, I don't, set function. I don't Are you saying your heart is there to see? Not my heart. But okay, hey, kidney. Your, is your kidney there to hear? No. So, you see, what I'm so let's let's think about something. Your kidney there is specifically serving a function from the whole body. You haven't designed it and you haven't set its purpose. Every single organ of your body has been established with a function. Our eyes with vision. So your eyes, what's the function of the eyes? No, not the eyes. So there's in biology, there's mm -hmm. a thing called vestigial organs. Like what? Vestigial. Yeah, I know. I studied biology too. Oh, okay, okay. So what is a vestigial organ? Um, it's an organ that's not really... Give me an example. The appendix. I'm not like, I didn't the appendix, it. right? Yeah. That's what they thought. I'm telling you, the reason people thought this is a vestigial is because they didn't know its function. Now we know the importance of appendix in stress control. Yeah? The, the list of vestigial organs at one point was very long. But guess what happened to that list? It's gradually and gradually and gradually shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. Because the more we understand science, the more we understand the roles of those things which we call vestigial. Okay, so appendix. An example. Now talk about the appendix. Appendix, the reason I gave you an example of appendix. This is a, a real, what's called, a, an eye-opener for people who think this way. Appendix was glorified example of a vestigial organ until scientists told us otherwise in recent years. They told us, no, the appendix has a function. It has a purpose in our body. Okay. But prior to that, because of our ignorance within the scientific community, not lay people, the lay people are ignorant anyway, the scientists, because they didn't know, they hailed and glorified and then they said, okay, this is a textbook definition, an example of a vestigial organ. Only to be humble enough to admit that it is no longer vestigial. So my point is, the scientists at one point, because of the ignorance, 
of its function, they called it vestigial because they didn't know it functions. You know junk DNA? Have you heard about junk DNA? A junk DNA, people think junk DNA doesn't have a function. Now we realize those who are in genetics, junk DNA has functions. It's not junk as in like it doesn't have any purpose. But they called it junk because at that time they had no demonstrable, when I say demonstrable, they couldn't demonstrate what function serves. But now we know how the function of those DNAs parts are. So the list, my friend, go to a list 100 years ago. Now, compare the list 100 years ago, 50 years ago, 25 years ago. What you'll find is an astonishing truth. And that truth is the list is shrinking. So if the list is shrinking, what is our reasonable assumption that we should say? That it seems like in principle, what we call vestigial, as more and more science develops and progress, we are more likely to know the function of the things that we call vestigial. I'm not saying we'll definitely know, let's use the scientific jargon. We are more likely to know what its function is going to be, because that's what we've been observing throughout our historical exploration of science as we're living through it. We see that is the case. A good scientist, a good individual of critical thinking will make this approach saying it is more likely as time approaches, our knowledge expands, we will know the functions of the male nipple, for example, which they're laughing about, like oh, what's the function of it? They talk about the, the coccyx, the human tail that's there, yeah? So, but as more and more we develop our science, I'm not saying they don't have a function or they have a function, I'm just illustrating with the example they brought about. It is more likely that we know. So when we talk about all of these things, I've lost the point I was going to make about this, but you brought vestigial organs. There is no such thing as is a leftover of an evolutionary byproduct. That's what they thought. Evolution, because it's blind, it just happens, and then it somehow, you know, initially you had fins to um, swim underwater and gills, and now you don't need to do that. So anything that exhibits is a leftover of that thing. We will eventually discover this, what is the case? It's like the example of a penguin. The penguin is used to say, the wings of a penguin is useless yeah. because but if you if you really study the aerodynamic nature of a penguin it's not flight. flight in the water <laughs> no 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 flight. flight in the water do you see how they fly in the water observe next time they swim no fly. no the they wings the way they use their wings underneath the water the the amount we talk about aerodynamics right yeah you're talking about the design feature of just making it thin like that to make it faster. Yeah. The wing, the way they are proportioned, the way they are there is exactly the you need for it to propel so fast. So it is not a biological remains of a evolutionary process as a leftover. It's a design feature built in already. So I can give you many examples of people talk about it, but enough of the two examples I illustrated, you can go on and go into this debate if you want, from the camp of the evolutionist and the one who opposes evolution. And you will see this debate is going on for months and years. And scientists say, okay, fine, you know what, appendix, okay, we'll take, take it from the list now. So it's ongoing learning process for each one. And the people who didn't know how to explain, they didn't say, okay, fine, you know what, God made it that way, they will say, fine, we will learn as we learn about our science. Junk DNA, now it's not junk anymore. We need that part of that DNA parts, otherwise this coding is not going to happen. Please go and study about genetics and you will be surprised the amount of information. It's there, assembled together to switch on and off the genes to make your eyes, they are, they make it the tall as you are, they make your, the build that you are. It's all this genetic component will switch on, off, on, off. And yet we are supposed to believe that this all happened by just like that. So I want to I want to leave you with this thought. I think we have talked about enough. The only thing that we were discussing about is agency, which is consciousness or not. Okay. So think about this level of complexity and where that letter that I gave you example of why you're saying I'm content that this is coming from myself. Um, and you would say this is more likely, this is how my heart will be settled with that rather than this letter 
just popped into existence from nothing. And then it just got over the millions of years, the ink, the carbon, the ink, whatever it's made of, and the paper, they assembled together. And it's, the likelihood is there, what they're saying, the probability, even though it's minuscule, it's not zero. That's what the scientists are saying, the mathematicians are saying. But in your heart, in your mind, when they are together working in cooperation, you will say, I'm content to subscribe to the view that this is from Mansuda I spoke to in Speaker's Corner on that day, rather than that. Likewise, you need to make that kind of subscription to the agency, whether it's conscious or unconscious, about the whole cosmos all around them. That is something that you have to do yourself. The digging, the critical thinking, the information analysis, you have to do yourself. What we were doing, trying to do here as Muslims is awaken the spirit of critical thinking, awaken the spirit of the thinking outside the boundary of the social constraints, constraints by our media, telling you watch this movie and go into this matrix and that's it, be happy and you think, yeah, everything is possible, you know, maybe you don't exist. You'll be surprised how many hyper-skeptic individuals that I speak to in Speaker's Corner who even not sure whether they exist or not. You'll be surprised. You, you, you'll be surprised. Dawa-wise is my mine and Hashim's channels. If you go and, and, and you know, watch some of the videos, there's so many people we speak to. That's what the societal conditioning is. What we are saying is there are forces around here other than our own desires and our own thinking which wants us to take away from the path of knowing the truth Sub, sub being subservient to our creator and this is the agency of like we call the unseen creations called the jinn and satan is one of them and he doesn't want anyone to to be successful in this life or hereafter he will show you and, and he will allow you all of these things and try to divert you and try to take your attention away from the reality of the existence which is forever and forever and always say be preoccupied with this life and be happy because why worry about all of that because you're okay now so that's what we are saying is the quran reminds us from this intelligence agency what we call god the creator to awaken ourselves from the shackles and from the bondage of, of this materialism, of consumerism, of liberal capital thinking, and wake our mind and spirit to think critically, openly, and then say, okay, fine, this makes sense to me, my heart and mind, and this is finally in, 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 in resonance. So why am I not going to be thankful to my God, my creator who created me? I know this is the case. That decision has, has to come from you on your own particular decision that you make without being coerced, without being somehow forced, but something that you take in for your own self, willingly, sincerely, with the truth and love. So I will leave you with that. If you have any questions, you can ask, but I would like to give you this Quran uh, as a gift um, and read about it. There's various ways of reading it from the beginning to end. The Quran is not like a book which starts out in the beginning and it ends in, and this is at the end. You will find it quite different. So you can read it. You can read any chapter on its own. The, it's called a surah, 114 surahs. You can read. There are thematic unity. Each surah has a unique message. All the surahs you will see either this way, that way, they remind us about our God, our Creator. And there is also thematic, topical way of reading, like from the index, like God. Oh, let me learn about God, His unity and exclusiveness, mm, His sovereignty and dominion. I want to know about mm, His sight and hearing, His provision. I want to know about hellfire. Let me look into this. Okay, Day of Resurrection, 248, means chapter 2, Surah 2, Ayah 48, when verse 48. Mansur. And then you look into it, and say, okay, this is what it says. So this you'll find is something that will help you as an information to, to as I said, awaken your spirit, and you make the decision. If it's not from God, you don't have to believe in it. If it's from God, ask yourself, why am I not a Muslim? Whatever you look for, you will find it in the Inshallah. Allah always has whatever people do. So we are all in unison in informing you that you need to seek information, yeah. expand knowledge and information. Did we ever say you yeah, just yeah. believe are you going to go to hell? Did you ever no, hear no, from no, anyone no. else? It's not our problem. No, no, because you know that we need to make our own informed choices and decisions. And that I'm, I'm positive you will do.
time to do this. Well, I'm just one more thing to look at the world in order to rationally come And just to recommend the channel that I recently got into, it's called Thought Adventure, Thought Adventure, Thought Adventure Podcast. So there are four friends of ours, Sharif, Yusuf Pondus, there is Jake, the Muslim metaphysician, and there is brother Abdul Rahman. Abdul Rahman. Four brothers. It's called Thought Adventure Podcast, and I would recommend it too. Why? Because they deal with these kind of questions, and they've invited Aaron Ra, for example, at one point on their channel, and Aaron Ra left with, with the understanding that there is a necessary being. That is the transformation that happened. So they're very intelligent, bright, far, far brighter than, you know, you know my humble self and they will really argue with the reason I can discuss with them. So I'll, I'll show you which channel that is. Thought. Thank you for recommending that. I got into It changed my on a lot. Thought Adventure Podcast. Okay. So this brother is Brother Abdul Rahman. And you can see there's three others. So they they have they're, they are mainly concerned or engaging with academic uh, scholars, scholarship, because that's where you can have meaningful exchange with someone who is sincere, someone who is within the field, to exchange information to the level that is required, rather than speaking to Tom, Dick and Harry, like myself, for example. You won't get that information. I won't be able to tell you about the, the, the for example, the philosophical issues on this or the arguments for and against but they will certainly so please go and uh, you know listen to them um, and, and our channel my, myself uh, is Dawa Wise you know, if, you, if, you, if you want to go and have a look at the other discussions we had with many other uh, free thinkers and humanists agnostics and atheists just to awaken the mind so that they can make up on their mind. I mean, we don't force anyone to become a Muslim, but it's our hope and our desire and our wish that you become a Muslim, that you save yourself from the punishment, uh, because God created us for a purpose, to do the will of God, and He promised us that if you do that, then He will give you paradise, which is eternal bliss and joy and happiness and tranquility and contentment. And if you disobey and reject Him, by, because with arrogance and stubbornness, knowing the truth, not like someone didn't know, but knowing the truth and you reject it arrogantly with stubbornness, then he has placed them uh, uh, in a place called hellfire, which will be the final and eternal abode, punishment. So we want no one to go there. We don't want anyone, we don't want you, me, to go into hellfire to be burnt and punished and be suffered in the punishment forever and forever. We want good of every human being. All we can do is share the message of Islam to you and you make your decision because at the end of the day, you will be responsible for your own actions and your own belief and your own choice. So it was a pleasure speaking to you, Michael. Um, we hope to meet again, perhaps, and one day meet again, you as a Muslim. You take care. Okay, we'll take it. Just a moment, if I can. Mansoor al Hashim. Where are, where are Hashim. I'm Iman Sur. Mansoor. So you see, look at look how people are in the camera. Now. You know. Okay. How are you going? Is there any more? Any more anywhere? Yeah, yes. Oh, oh well, This is ours. Yeah. Any, any others? No, no, I can't. Thank you. Uh, my wife. Your wife is in Where are you from? No, we've just started. Um, 